So you partnered with John Wozniak, uh, who was a part of Marcy Playground. So people remember Sex and Candy. That was, you know, uh, when was that? Like 97, 94? I think it, yeah, probably around, yep. Yeah, I think it was probably around 95, 96, maybe somewhere around there. Yeah. 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 I remember that was maybe the biggest song of the year. I oh, mean, for that, sure. That was unbelievable. So I, I was giving the song as a reference for our listeners. If, if, you know, some of our younger listeners, if they didn't know who Marcy Playground was. Um, so what was it like partnering with him? You know, someone that's had so much success and did you feel any pressure moving uh, uh, an iconic studio like Mushroom Studio from Vancouver over to Toronto? I mean, they had worked with Tegan and Sarah and Bachman Turner Overdrive and Sarah McLaughlin. So what, what kind of pressure do you feel as a, as a young dude involved in these projects? I mean, to be honest with you, it was easy because John's just such a laid back dude, you know? Um, and I actually found a guy that was even more of a gear pig than I was. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a match made in heaven in terms of, you know, being around gear because he's incredibly knowledgeable. Like it's, and it's not to discredit musicians in any way, shape or form, but he's one of those guys where you're kind of like, oh, he's a singer of, you know, this band that was really popular and had a hit song and this and that. You don't expect the guy to be as techy as he is. And he's insanely techy. I mean, down to the point where, I mean, he can tell you what's, what circuit board or what transformers in whatever type of console strip or which piece of outboard gear. Um, so, so, I mean, the pressure, I mean, it's not that there was pressure. Um, the pressure was the timeline, just trying to get it all done and on a budget. Um, because that's always the big thing with, uh, with labels or studios is the budget, right? We well, dream on a budget here is something you hear a lot. Well, that's it. I mean, with Sony BMG, it was a little easier because I mean, we're talking about a large entity and, you know, if things went a little over, I mean, you try not to, but it's, it's not going to kill them. Um, you know, John's a sole person and yes, of course he had done well in his life and, but it's just, you know, it's, it's someone that has entrusted you to make sure that things stay on, on, you know, on par with what's, what we've talked about. So, I mean, there was a bit of pressure in trying to do that because obviously there's always hiccups when you're putting a place together, especially where we had, because we built the place in Queen West. Um, and it's funny, we were looking for, for months, we were looking for a building to place this in. Uh, we even went all the way up to Streetsville. Uh, and thought about doing it out there. And then John all of a sudden gets wind of this place in Queen West. That's, it was like around uh, uh, Queen and Dufferin area. And, uh, and basically it's this old building. <coughs> and he's like, dude, you got to check out this place. And, and he, sh he sends me pictures and I'm like, ah, it looks a little weird. Uh, cool, but weird. And he's like, dude, it's, it's, meant for, it's meant to be a studio. This place couldn't be more rock and roll than, than anything. It started off, it's a turn of the century building. It was built as a tombstone factory originally. Then it became a methadone clinic. Then it became- This is so rock and roll, keep going. And, and then it became home to um, a, uh, a company called Play Dead Cult, which did all this kind of like gothic style, you know, um, merch. And then we took over as a punk rock, you know, rock studio. So it was just like, this is where it's got to be. Yeah. How does that not become a rock studio? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, but it was, yeah, it was a bit of a building that it was an old building. It was a bit dingy. Um, so there was a lot of work to deal with. Um, I mean, we moved into the basement because obviously trying to be on a, but or we were on a budget. So we tried to take, you know, advantage of the natural isolation as much as possible as, you know, being down underground, uh, without having to do a ton of soundproofing and, and not, you know, disturb the neighborhood that was around us. So, so getting the basement cleaned up was a bit of a, a bit of a feat. Um, we ended up finding this really creepy room called the, uh, we ended up calling it the blood room. Um, there you go. That scene, <laughs> that title is apropos, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, it was this old kind of like burner that was out there, like an old, uh, not burner, sorry, an old boiler. Uh, it was a boiler room and the play dead guys had done a video in there cause they had a band as well. And gothic style band and there was blood splattered all over the walls for the video shoot so you open this door and there's like this dirt floor with this old boiler from like the, you know the early 1900s and it's all rusted out and and there's like blood like all over the walls and on this thing and it was just like okay man this yeah this is definitely a rock and roll studio <laughs> yeah let's sign the papers on this lease that's funny um my experience of of top-notch recording studios is 
they all look like abandoned warehouses from the outside. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like people drive by and they assume nothing's there, which is what you want as a studio that has like $10 million worth of equipment. You don't want to alert people that shouldn't be there anyways. And then anyone that needs to be there to record, they know where it is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And especially in this case, cause I mean, John's gear collection was just insane. Um, I mean, he had hauled back over an old vintage Neve. Um, he had mics that you were just kind of like, where did these come from? Like it's, you know, he had a pair of original uh, Telefunken C12s, a matching pair of all things, um, you know, U47s, 67s. I mean, any mic that you would want, he had at least one of, you know, um, and they're all vintage pieces. I mean, he was a collector. So there was, you know, he had a Fairchild, uh, which is, you know, a compressor that's very, very difficult to come by. He actually owned one. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that we didn't want people knowing about for sure. <laughs>